So we're going to get started. So this session is looking at the relationship between reading and writing um, and how we can use reading to help our students become better writers. Um, so that, that is what we're going to try to um, understand and to begin working on in today's meeting. So um, this is our agenda. It's a lot to cover, um, partly because I really wanted to respond to some of the feedback about wanting more concrete um, you know, suggestions about how we can do things. Um, so I have integrated into this a lot of what I do. And um, I want to say right now that just because I'm showing you what I do doesn't mean that you have to do this. But for me, as as a as a learner, um, it does help me to see um, other people's examples and then to use those as a jumping off point. So I hope that helps. Um, so today you'll see some of my reading assignments, um, which include rubrics. And you'll actually see, um, in one case, the actual student product um, and see, see what I'm getting at. Um, and then we'll have um, some independent writing. Um, I hope we'll have time for a small group workshop. If not, then we won't be doing that. Um, and then take time as a group to reflect on, on what we did today. So we're going to go ahead and get started with what we're doing today. So the goal for today's um, meeting is that we'll develop lessons to teach critical reading um, skills and um, various evaluation methods that yoke reading and writing as disciplinary activities. And we're going to do that through a variety of methods. Um, we'll start with understanding the instructor and student assumptions about reading and writing connections. Um, and then we're going to consider some solutions for teaching the connection between reading and writing um, and some examples of uh, reading writing assignments. And that's how I think about them are reading writing assignments. Um, we'll interrogate our practices and assumptions. Then we'll write drafts of reading writing assignments. And then, if, like I said, if we have time, we'll workshop um, our assignment drafts. So I just want to start with instructors' assumptions about um, about read, student reading, and part of that comes from the Bun article. Um, part of it comes from my own experiences, my assumptions that I held earlier in my um, teaching career, but also that I've heard from instructors. So um, in my capacity as a writing center director, I very frequently um, get um, receive faculty wanting me to to help them help students and um, these are just some of the the statements that I've heard and um, actually confirms a lot of, of what I heard which is um, helpful for me I always like <laughs> I like a little confirmation so one of our assumptions is that reading and writing are inexorably connected um, and Bunn complicates this in, in his article as he interviews some teachers um, because some teachers acknowledge, and this has been my experience too, that you can have strong readers who aren't great writers and vice versa. Um, but in general, we know that there is some kind of connection between reading and writing. Um, and I think you know there's there's there are opportunities for research to tease that out a little bit. Um, we know um, and we assume that reading and writing negotiate and create knowledge, which is usually why we have students read. Um, we often have them read because we think they need to know this, right? Um, and so we tend to assume that students understand that they are reading because we think they need to know um, what the reading is offering. Um, other assumptions I've heard, and these are sort of across the board, um, is that university students, regardless of their rank at the school, uh, know how to read. And when I say how to read, I don't just mean, you know, literacy, right, traditional literacy, but how to read as an, as an academic. So how to read actively, which is that following bullet. Um, so that we expect that they have learned how to read actively, that they know how to engage with the text. Um, but what I have learned in working with students fresh out of high school, typically, um, when I'm working with um, student writers in um, first year writing courses, is that um, when they did read, it was very passive. 
um, because they weren't expected to negotiate with the text, right? So we have these assumptions that they know how to read the way we do, but um, they, they may not have been taught that. And then I've also heard that students don't read because they're lazy. And so those are just a few of the assumptions. There may be more, but these are the ones that I encounter the most when I'm having conversations about student reading. And they're ones that I have said myself. Again, when I was you know, newer, younger in my career, I have said these exact things. So um, I want to talk a little bit about students' reactions to reading. So Bun reminds us that um, many students don't see the link or the connections between reading and writing, um, and they don't see how readings are connected to course content, especially um, assignments and evaluations. So they often interpret reading as just busy work um, that the, 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 the teacher assigns and that it doesn't have a consistent or, or a particular meaning to class. Um, they get frustrated sometimes with reading because they will come into class and the, um, the, the instructor will lecture on what they read. So the, they'll get just the reading repeated at them. And so they feel like, why am I reading when the instructor is going to just repeat the reading to me? Um, and because it isn't evaluated, it feels like a waste of their time, like it doesn't benefit them. And for better or for worse, we do have students who are very um, focused on their grades. And, um, and what is evaluated over what is not. Now, I don't love that aspect of student expectations. Um, and I, as a teacher, talk a lot about the work that isn't evaluated and how that work, that non-evaluated work, tends to show up in what we actually evaluate. Um, but these are some of the reasons why, or some of the reactions students have to readings. But I also want to talk about other realities. Um, Students are busy. For example, in uh, the course that I'm teaching, which is a 400 level um, cultural rhetorics course, which is my particular niche in rhetoric, um, I've got students who are working two to three jobs. I have students who are also caring for parents and grandparents during COVID. I have students who have children. Um, I have students who, um, are, are volunteering. So I have I have one student who is, um, this is the second time she's taken a course with me, and she's got three internships this semester. Um, students are busy, and yes, we could have conversations with them about learning how to say no and time management, but in many cases, they can't necessarily say no, especially when it comes to jobs. They need to work. Um, students are also struggling a lot with their physical and mental health, um, with housing and food insecurity, and with adulting. I know that, you know, that kind of millennial and Gen Z language, some people don't like it, but I think um, adulting is a word that really resonates. Becoming an adult is very difficult, and as I uh, learned recently in a, in a CTE workshop that um, I'm just plugging right now to Zavery and Lydia needs to happen more often and be like have more sessions to it. Um, students' brains are not fully developed. Um, their brains are still maturing, neural pathways are still being connected. And so they really are learning how to be adults. Um, they still, in many ways, have adolescent brains. And so there's a lot of struggle there. Um, they, they're learning through a lot of mistakes. And so they could be overwhelmed with their physical and mental health. And I've created an environment in my classroom where students tend to be very open with me about these things. So I have had students email me and say they were trying to read and they weren't for, or they couldn't do it successfully because of some reason, whether the reading triggered something, whether um, they are not able to get their ADHD medication and really can't focus on it. Um, and so these are things to think about, particularly during COVID. And as far as I can tell, COVID um, issues are going to extend into our spring semester.
The other is that students really don't know how to read as academics unless they went to a school that really did prepare them for academic reading. Their reading habits tend to be very passive. They tend to just read it and put it away. Um, they have been taught to read in one sitting and not over time. Um, because they are penalized for writing in their books when they are in high school, they don't write or engage with the text. Um, and so, and they also often, again, don't see the um, readings as, as um, necessarily connected to what they're doing in the course. Um, and they really haven't been taught basic active reading skills, which I think of as acting, active listening skills. And so these are the realities that intervene in the classroom. And what I've learned is a lot of my assumptions um, if I think back to myself as a student, and I was a very strong student, most of us who are instructors were very strong students, even I didn't necessarily know how to read actively. Um, and it wasn't until I started seeing my professors do certain things that I began to try to mimic what they were doing. And so I've been trying to think back to my experiences as an undergraduate and early graduate student and how can I go actively teach them. These, um, these things. So these are just some of the realities. This is, these are not exhaustive lists, nor are they meant to. They don't necessarily capture every student, um, but especially in, um, in, you know, during this COVID era, um, I'm seeing this a lot. So I want to talk about some solutions to this issue of students not reading, right, and our assumptions and frustration with student reading. And the first is to um, get back to universal design. Um, and I just want to, again, give another CTE um, call out because the CTE, um, and Lydia, has, Lydia in particular does this a lot, um, does talk a great deal about universal de design and especially if you take Lydia's um, syllabus development courses, um, they, they go just directly through universal design. So I'm not going to go over universal design um, in great depth, but I do encourage you to um, take the take those courses. I will admit that first when I was introduced to universal design, I was a little resistant but I decided to apply what I was learning in the classroom, and oh my goodness, um, my resistance was was just silly because I'm seeing a real difference. So universal design um, engages us in course development and assignment development in particular ways. First, asking, make, making us ask ourselves and even write out to the students why they are learning this course content. Right. So we have to think for ourselves, what is this content adding to their disciplinary knowledge and not just in terms of the actual content that they're learning, but the activities that they're going to be doing. How is this working towards um, developing some kind of disciplinary knowledge and then not just knowledge, but disciplinary practices and remember that as instructors, we're not just teaching knowledge, we're teaching practices. Thank you. I, I have um, I have that exact website up, Lydia, um, on my on my um, browser because I went back and was reviewing it earlier. So yeah, that's a great website that Lydia just put in for Universal Design, and like I said, I have it up right now. The next step in universal design is thinking about what students are actually learning. And this is where you develop the learning outcomes. And then finally, once you've understood why students are learning what they're learning and what they are actually learning, then you can think about the how they're learning, the methods of your instruction, activities, projects, um, even the kind of grading and rubrics you're using. That's when you do the how and you move in this particular order. Now, typically, and this is what I did before I um, learned and committed to universal design, we start with the how they're learning, uh, so the methods and activities. So we come to syllabus creation thinking, here are all the things that the students must read, here are all the things that they must do. And then we build everything backwards. We might then go to the why students are learning and then the what they're learning, the learning outcomes. And in fact, I, I can speak again only for myself, but in my experience, I used to think very, very little 
about the learning outcomes. I would just kind of throw them up. I'd find what departmental learning outcomes were important and just sort of paste them on there. Um, and so those things came last and I started with the how first. The problem with starting with the how first is I don't know the why and the what. And so my classes um, really didn't seem unified. The readings didn't seem to work together. The assignments didn't um, necessarily scaffold from one to the next. It wasn't clear what knowledge and skills the students were learning from one module or unit to the next. But when we start with universal design and really take time to develop those learning outcomes, then we can end up really thinking about what exactly we need students to do and what we need to do as instructors. And so as I started to focus on the learning outcomes, what are they learning? I ended up noticing a few um, uh, results in my teaching. The first is the readings. I really started to question how much reading I had them read. And I started to wonder what readings were absolutely necessary. So one of the things that I do personally, it's not necessarily in my course schedule, but I do purposely is think about the learning outcomes for each class. And so I think about what learning outcomes am I emphasizing in this class, um, in this meeting that they're going to be reading in advance for, what reading or readings are absolutely necessary to achieve that. And then I asked myself questions about writing, what informal writing is necessary and what formal writing is necessary to achieve those learning outcomes. And then what instruction do I need to provide and in what modalities? Um, so that might say, you know, make me think about, do I need to provide a lecture? Um, do I need to provide a guided activity? What is it that I'm going to be doing? So in every class, and I'm working right now on um, polishing up my class meeting today with the students in my course, I start always with what learning outcomes am I emphasizing today? Um, how are they connected to the unit? I always have learning outcomes for each unit. And then, um, then I think about, okay, what are we actually doing? What ratings are necessary? And I did decrease my ratings. Um, I've gotten to a point where for me personally, and yes, I'm teaching content-driven uh, material, cultural rhetorics is a content-driven um, subject. I, I actually have cut, um, scaled back my reading um, because, in this case, if we spend more time with the readings in the ways I'm going to show you later, the students are achieving those learning outcomes and I'm seeing better results in their papers. And I'm seeing that connection from reading to writing. So again, um, what I was seeing is reduced reading, um, reading load. So that's one outcome of what I've been doing. But I also um, found that with less reading to cover, I had more opportunities um, to give instruction in reading and writing um, because much like all of y'all, I had moments where I thought, you know, how am I supposed to fit writing instruction into a history of rhetoric course or, um, or some kind of rhetorical theory course or even a pedagogy course. Um, but when I really thought about making sure that the readings were speaking to the outcomes and then how do I connect the reading um, to the activities in the class meeting in order to meet those outcomes, um, then I saw all these opportunities. So the second solution, building off, these are not necessarily discrete, um, is teaching reading and radical transparency. So what I've been doing the last several years, and this is even before I learned universal design, I already started to do this, and now I do it much more, um, is I write assignments. Um, that speak to the learning outcomes. And I, I actually include the learning outcomes on assignment sheets. And that includes assignments for reading. So one of the things that you'll see is that I actually um, assign reading in a particular way in my courses. And I include um, learning outcomes and explanation for why we're reading um, in those, those assignment sheets. So I actually have a whole assignment sheet for reading. Um, I explain to the students why they're reading and I try to be as clear and transparent as possible so I bring up um you know uh sort of conversations about Kenneth Burke's um 
parlor metaphor, and some of you may have heard that, Lisa. I'm sure that you're super familiar with that um, since we're in the same field um, or similar field, but it's the concept that the work that we're doing as academics or any conversation where people are talking with each other in writing is that the reading portion of what we're doing is like being in a parlor and listening to the conversations going on and then the writing portion is when we finally decide to engage in the conversation when we decide to participate and so I try to explain why we need to read um, before we can write um, and I'll sometimes talk about the Berkey and parlor depending on sort of the level of the students um, or I'll use other metaphors I refer to the readings in the assignment sheets. Um, so I make sure that in formal writing assignments, I am referring back to the readings so that they um, get that message that the readings have been important. Um, I engage students in thinking about the connection between reading and writing. So I'll have um, questions where I even ask them to tell me, why did we read this reading today? What is it doing? I want you to think about the project that we're working towards. I do create reading assignments and I have them graded and I have a, um, a rubric and I use those reading assignments to replace participation grades with these reading writing grades. Um, I personally believe that grading participation is unethical um, because our expectations for um, participation tend to be ableist. They can be sexist um, and they can prioritize Western concepts of participation. So what do I mean by all of this? Um, let's start with ableist. Um, students with all kinds of disabilities, visible and invisible, may struggle with participation and the ways that we gauge what participation looks like. Um, it also prioritizes um, extroversion over introversion. So you have a lot of people who in group settings in particular um, want to sit and listen and they carefully plan what they're going to say. I'm actually an introvert. I perform extroversion very, very well. But when I attend a lecture or a keynote address, I'm very unlikely, or even a conference presentation, I'm actually very unlikely to ask a question because I'm spending a lot of time listening to the content and developing questions later than I end up emailing to the participants. Um, students with disabilities, whether it is um, mental illness, whether it is a cognitive illness, whether it's neurodifferent not be able to um, participate in ways that we reward, um, talking in class, making eye contact, right? Um, and also, very typically, male students have been socialized to engage in those ways, and female students less often have been um, socialized and taught how to engage in those ways. And there's more, right? Other students from other cultures um, may not have been taught to engage or to participate in courses the way that American students have. Um, this is particularly true. I have found, this again, this is my experience with Asian students who are much more likely to want to listen um, rather than necessarily engage in discussion because of the kind of educational experiences they've had. Now, this is my experience and um, what I've learned in conversation with students, particularly from China. I do not want to say this is all students. I just want to make that clear. So instead of uh, grading participation, um, what I do is I grade their reading writing grades. Um, so I'll show you some of what that looks like. And this gives students the opportunity to show that they are reading. So first to demonstrate it and then to engage with the reading through writing. Um, so we'll look at some, um, some examples. So here's part of what I do. This is sort of how I, I plan my semester out. So in weeks one and two, I spend time teaching students how to read. This is particularly true of students in an introductory class, so a 100 level course and even sometimes a 200 level course. Um, I usually have students read, annotate, and write um, a discussion board about the syllabus before the class meeting. So I'll send the syllabus out before the class meeting um, and I'll go ahead and, and um, collect their questions about that so I can address it on day one, but I do not actually then end up reviewing the syllabus. So what I'm trying to do is get them to read the syllabus and then actually do some of that critical reading by saying, send me your questions, send me your comments, tell me where you're confused so I can address that. Um, 
I also send a quiz to students at the beginning of every semester and um, some of the questions in the quiz do try to help me understand their reading skills, their practices, and their assumptions about reading um, so I can address that in course. And then what I end up doing is teaching them how to fulfill the rubric of reading that I develop. So I demonstrate to them how to annotate or how to write a discussion board post um, or how to facilitate a course discussion. I, um, in a physical classroom, I actually bring in some of my favorite academic books that I've annotated. So for example, um, Toni Morrison's Playing in the Dark. I don't know if there's a page that I haven't written on um, and I'll pass it around and as I'm passing it around I'll talk to them about the different kinds of annotations they'll see that demonstrate engaged reading and learning um, and I'll talk about why writing in your books in various ways um, helps you write projects and so they get to see my own examples um, then I'll explain the pedagogy I'll actually talk a little bit about cognitive science um, because I did a little bit of research and then I'll have them actually practice in class how to annotate their books or how to write these discussion boards and then we'll reflect on what they learned through the process. So I'm going to show you some exa examples of active reading, listening, or what I like to call reading writing um, and I'm going to show you introductory, intermediate, and advanced levels. So this is a, this is an assignment I have at the introductory level. So this is what um, English 101, um, our first year writing, um, looks like. And also, I tend to do this for 200 level courses as well. So when I teach, when I taught a 200 level um, history of rhetoric course, this is a rubric that I used. So every week um, here I have it um, Thursday doing Blackboard at a particular time. Um, I had them post their annotation. So you can see first that I explain why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I say I'm going to check your course, your readings for annotations, critical engagement with the readings to demonstrate your critical reading. The exercise keeps you accountable for your readings without testing for content knowledge. More importantly, it emphasizes your engagement with the text and reading as active as an active rather than passive learner it helps you prepare for class and it helps you develop topics um, or questions for class annotations receive a daily grade of um, a which is five points satisfactory 3.75 points or an f for zero points for not annotating and these grades factor into the 10 percent for homework and in-class rating um, a and C annotations will include at least five pages that demonstrate your best engagement with the week's text. So what I do is they show me engagement um, once a week over the course of the week. F annotations will provide fewer than five pages, and again, they will not conform to the directions. I always start with a C because I want to normalize that C is actually meeting expectations and A is exceeding, so I like to start with the C. Um, so I explain that C annotations summarize the text and define key terms. That's just what they do. They just say, here's what the text said, and maybe I didn't know a word, so I'm going to define it. A annotations will brainstorm ideas for projects, challenge the text, make connections to other readings, including those maybe outside of uh, class or prior knowledge that they have, ask questions, analyze the text, agree with the text and explain why, and extend the argument. And then F annotations really just highlight or underline, that's all they do. And you're not, you're not annotating if you do that. You will post photographs or scanned images of your annotations weekly to Blackboard. You are responsible for including that the images are clear and accessible on both Mac and PC computers. Um, and I tell them where they can access a scanner. Um, and then I also suggest apps like Tiny Scanner, and there are a couple of others. So um, what I do on the first day of class is I bring these directions in. I share my own annotations. I have them practice in class using the syllabus. We have a course text. So I have them use the syllabus and go through this. And then I invite them to share their thoughts from their annotations. Um, and so they see how it starts shaping class conversations. So I just want to show you some examples. I know that this picture isn't quite large. Um, this is a student from here at the University of South Carolina. It's a first year student. And um, you can see that they are trying to engage. They've got questions. Um, they even say, I don't like this because ethics are different. 
Um, they're not quite getting what ethics are. They're talking about anger, but they're trying to engage um, in here. And so I really appreciate seeing um, how they're interpreting the text. And as I grade it, I really just look for a couple of things. Are they following um, the rubrics that I set up? And then I also do look at where they're misunderstanding the text. And I take note um, so that I can later address any issues I see in class. And I can tell you an example about that. Um, so when I was teaching at Virginia Military Institute, I was teaching um, a digital rhetorics course, and we had read uh, an article that came out of Canada's educational um, department, and they were talking about ways that they teach um, ethical internet engagement. And there was literally a sentence in the text that said, fear tactics do not work um, to, to um, in terms of um, keeping students safe on the internet and in terms of um, fostering ethical behavior. So fear tactics do not work. I was looking at their annotations before class because I tried to make them do before class. So if I found issues, I could address them. And across the board, the cadets wrote, fear tactics work. <laughs> Use fear tactics. And I thought, oh my god, what are they reading? And I do, you know, coming from VMI, having been there for a number of years, I realized that for them, there was a cultural, there was some cultural knowledge that was imposing themselves. So at VMI, you may have heard it's in the news quite a bit right now. Um, there is a real uh, disdain for and distrust of um, online content. Um, and so they are taught um, from the moment they walk in that they should not be using online content, that they should not be writing on social media, that they should not engage online. And so I think some of that um, imposed itself um onto the reading so I was able to come in I was able to say why did you where did you pick that up and then to talk about um why the 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 uh writers were suggesting otherwise so it was really helpful for me to also see where misunderstandings were this is another example it's much more blown up this is a student actually annotating their research so sometimes what I'll do um, when they're working on a project is I'll say um, you can go ahead and give me annotations of the research that you're collecting for class. Um, and so here I'm seeing the student um, talking about Kairos, which is a concept that we learned in 102. So I see that they're actually trying to apply course content to their evaluation of the article. Um, we have some moments of summary. Um, and then we've got some questions going on and some other questions. Um, and again, sort of summary and um, trying to understand the text. And so I was very happy to see what was going on in here. And here's another example. This is, um, again, going back into the course uh, textbook. Um, and you can see the student just thinking through uh, their process. They um, didn't think it mattered. Um, so we're, the, the book actually talks about the photograph for the cover, um, the choice that they make, um, but then realizes that they are trying to speak only for themselves. Um, and then note to professor, so this is a note to me, um, with, um, look into Sims dorm and I get that a lot. I didn't include these annotations in there. These are from BMI. I really appreciated them. The student used instead of writing the book, the students renting. So they use sticky notes, post-it notes, and they actually put in questions uh, to me. So they would say there, I, my honorific was major. So it's a major Garriott, blah, blah, blah. And then there was a really funny, I'll never forget this one, where the student was reading about the sophist and goes, Major Garriott, I think you're a sophist. And then they kept reading. And then I saw a sticky note going, never mind, Major Garriott, I changed my mind. You're definitely not a sophist. Right? And so like that showed a real application of their reading onto what was even happening in the classroom and the kind of tactics that I was using in the classroom. For intermediate students, which is what I consider um, in many ways upper division students, um, I have them do discussion boards. And um, currently, again, I have a very small course. I put this in my email to y'all. I have 21 students. Only 20 seem to actively <laughs> engage. Um, I have them do discussion boards um, every class meeting day, and they have to do it before class. 
Um, so they do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, you can do this once a week. You can do it twice a month, however you want to do it. But I teach them first to summarize. So we learn the skill of summarizing. Then I teach them how to ask questions. And those are questions for the class, for discussion, questions to me for clarity. I teach them how to challenge the text. Um, and that can be certain kinds of questions, but it also engages um, and encourages them to go do some other research, back check the text. Um, and then I actually have them um, look back at the project assignment. How is this relating to the assignment? And I do actually have an assignment sheet for this. So I'm going to share that. Um, so if you give me just a second, I have to go back to the sharing application and uh, share my screen. So if you'll give me just a moment, I'm going to share these directions. So these are the directions that um, I have this semester for my discussion board. So twice weekly, um, by noon, you'll write discussion board. Um, I explained that these um, replace participation. Um, and I also explained that I will be a co-learner with them. Um, so even though I prepare my own topics, I go ahead and I have a, a brief lecture and then activity is prepared. I also do go to their discussion boards and I take some of uh, what they write, especially their questions, and I will integrate them, which is part of why they're due um, by noon. My class is at 2.50, so that gives me plenty of time to go back into my PowerPoint or my lesson plan and integrate some of what they were putting in. Um, so I will prepare a lecture, but I also use um, what they are talking about into the activities. Um, and then I also am trying to make it less instructor-centered and student-centered by having them write to each other. And then I include the learning outcomes. Uh, so these are straight from the syllabus. In fact, I just copied and pasted this language from the syllabus. Um, and then I have my directions in rubric. And again, I explain exactly what's going on. I have my grading criteria up here. Like I said, I always start with the C, just trying to normalize what the C actually does. And then I give a description of what the annotations do. Um, and I, again, I'm always referring them back to the syllabus, the quote or paraphrase from one of the course readings, and where you can provide a screenshot, provide a close reading, validate any claims um, by using the source. Um, and then I actually do have them respond to each other. Now I've gotten mixed results about this, so I don't know what I'm going to do. I did a mid-semester check-in, and they said they hate responding to each other once a week. Um, some of them loved it. A good number of them said they hated it. So I either there are some multiple options I can try to explain better what I'm doing with this, or I can scrap it. There are some probably options in between. Um, and again, I talk about what a good response looks like. So I'm trying to get them also to engage talking with one another. So I want to show you some example questions. I actually um, go ahead and write my course schedule with these questions planned. Um, I may not do that in the future because later I decided there were better questions I could have asked. Um, I picked some of the ones I think were the strongest. So on week one, I had them read some foundational text. And these were the series of questions that I asked. Um, so I'm also developing questions that will get them to think about um, the connection between the readings, course content, um, and, and getting us to understand where the first project was in week two. Um, I tell them, like, okay, we read this text that uses the, the term constellate. Um, I want you to, you know, Google the word or search for other resources um, and try to figure out what that means and then finish the, your post with questions. Um, week five, um, I wanted them to describe an artifact. So for their um, paper, they were writing a rhetorical analysis of a non-linguistic text, um, which is something that we do a lot in cultural rhetorics. And we have read several um, several texts that go through thick description of these um, non-linguistic texts. So I wanted them to work on that description, which led directly into their paper. They, I mean, all of them included that work into their paper. I wanted them to refer to previous meetings as models. And then in class, we actually um, took particular readings and we did a study of them um, to see what a rhetorical analysis um, of a non-linguistic text looks like.
Um, for intermediate um, students, I do try to use those questions to help frame the lecture. And I'll also take opportunities to ask students to clarify their questions. So I did this last week with a student um, who had been feeling a little alienated from the course content. And I just said, you know, um, student, you had this really interesting question, but I wasn't quite sure to make it out. And can you explain? And it turned into a really great discussion. So it's a nice way of being able to um, call directly on students. They've already got thoughts prepared. So they're a little bit more confident talking than when we cold call them and they don't have ideas prepared. For advanced students, so I'm thinking graduate students, um, I have them become discussion leaders and they'll be in charge of leading a class for that day. They have to prep a summary of the reading. They then have to situate the re reading within the conversation of the course text and the fields. So they often end up producing an annotated bibliography and then they plan and lead discussion. Now, it's been a while since I've done this, so um, I don't have examples, but this is what I have done in those circumstances. So I want to give, um, Don talked a lot about teaching prose models, right? That we often expect um, students to see the readings that we do and mimic the moves that they make. And students struggle with intuiting that. They really struggle with how to read um, for a prose model. So I take many opportunities to do that. So usually the first half of the class, we talk about content, and then we'll start reading text as a model. So what I'm doing is sharing with you um, a, a passage of a text that I had the students look at. So these are two particular paragraphs that we were looking at. And I wanted them to look at structure in particular and how the um, writer transitions from one concept to another. I wanted them to look at where supports um, of their critique comes in. I wanted them to see how that critique is applied. Um, and then I wanted them to understand that there's flow, their connections, movements from one paragraph to the next. So then what does the next paragraph do? So I had this up on the board and I went through and showed them this. So this was an instructor led um, exercise where I went through, I pointed out particular phrases and sentences, explained what was happening, um, why it was effective. Then I had them do that with the same text. Um, so I gave them about 10 minutes to find one or two units of writing, uh, a thesis statement, a paragraph, a transition from uh, between paragraphs, the conclusion, integration of evidence, and then um, explain the strategies that they saw at work. So I taught them how to read um, for as a prose model, and then they can now include that kind of work in their annotations or in their discussion boards, thinking about these texts as prose models. Um, I also went over and talked to them about how paragraphs actually work. Um, particularly body paragraphs. I did this later with introductory paragraphs as well. Um, sometimes students really don't understand that paragraphs have a particular structure and every sentence has a function in a paragraph. And so um, we were looking at another paragraph. Um, and so I wanted them to do an activity where they identified the actual function of the paragraph. So not just what the paragraph says, not a summary, but actually what it does rhetorically. So identify the function or operation or purpose. Um, and then I wanted them to discuss the functions of sentences. And we reviewed in general that sentences one through three will offer a transition in topic sentences, sentences two. Uh, two to four typically direct our attention to the topic and then a source. Um, three through six will provide uh, an interpretation and analysis. And then sentences four through eight tend to um, synthesize with the thesis statement. Um, and so we went through that and then I wanted them to see how that was working in the text that we were doing. Then I turned that activity into making them write paragraphs that um, told them what to do with each paragraph. And I gave them this example. So in the first two sentences, I will transition from one idea to the other. And then just to 
to go through and, and dictate to themselves in paragraph form what they need to do in every paragraph, um, giving each sentence a purpose. Um, and that way they can focus on how each paragraph has to set up a particular lens with respect to a particular topic and so on and so forth. And then in that third paragraph, they might synthesize. So I was showing them how um, they need to provide analysis and then move into synthesis. So Bun shares questions um, with us that he asked participants of the studies, and I asked you in the email um, to be prepared to discuss your answers to these questions. So at this point, I'm stepping back as someone lecturing and, and showing you examples, and um, I'm interested in how you theorize reading and writing as connected activities, how are you explicitly teaching? Um, what effect, if any, does students' understanding of reading and writing connect um, to their motivation? As far as you can tell, you may not be able to. Um, and if you are explicitly teaching and writing, what are you doing? So what I'm hoping is these tasks will help you do that, especially like if you do a discussion board or you're able to check maybe annotations, you can bring those up. You can say, well, so-and-so said in the reading today, you know, and, and do some of that, right? Because you can you can show that lecture, but you can also open with, hey, I was um, reading through your annotations or your discussion boards, and I saw a lot of questions about this particular um, piece of content, whatever it is. So I want to pause for a second and, and talk about that before we move on to activities. So it kind of helps you know what lecture you might have to provide, 